Boxing won world championships, taking on the submission specialist. Taking on the submission specialist, Ayana Rasantaya. It's a very t difficult name to pronounce. I'm going to get it by tomorrow morning. Anyway, and also tomorrow afternoon, we have Paige Van Zandt making her bare knuckle fighting debut, as well as Chris Levin's final combat sports fight. So, it's going to be a very interesting weekend in, in the world of combat sports. But anyway, the picks for this weekend. And by the way, if you guys want to play along at tapology.com, the link in the description down below, you can you can follow my picks as well as compete with myself and other T1 MMA fans. Uh, you just got to sign up with tapology.com, make your picks, and just enjoy. So anyway, we begin in the 145-pound division with the Jamaican sensation O'Day Osborne against Jerome Rivera. Both fighters looking to make their or to get their first victories in the UFC. I'm going with O'Day Osborne in this fight. O'Day Osborne has a one-inch reach advantage going into this fight, the Jamaican sensation. Uh, I think he's going to get a first-round knockout. He's very, very fast. That's what we saw in his UFC debut. Even though he lost, uh, he's got a significant speed advantage against, I think, pretty much anybody amongst the unranked in the 145-pound weight class. Um, that's not a knock on Jerome Rivera by any means. By the way, Jerome Rivera jumping up two weight classes. Uh, a 17-day turnaround. That's a rather tough turnaround after going 15 minutes. Uh, quick turnaround for Jerome Rivera. I'm going with O'Day Osborne in this fight. Anyway, the next fight on the cards in the 145-pound division as well. Lots of 145-pound fights amongst the unranked. It's going to be an interesting night for the prospects at 145. Between the South Korean Sungwoo Choi against Yusuf Salah, the Moroccan uh, Yusuf Salah. Uh, Zalal has a significant advantage on the ground in this fight against Sungwoo Choi, who is a uh, nationally accredited and actually world accredited kickboxing world champion. Um, to want, he won, pardon me, the bronze medal at the Muay Thai World Championships back in 2010. However, it's used as a law that has five submission victories and it's a pro belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I can foresee him. Uh, him. He has landed nine takedowns in his UFC career as of yet. And that's in four fights. I believe that he's going to try to drag this fight down to the mat. I believe that he will get a second round submission over the South Korean Sungwoo Choi. Move on to the women's women's flyweight division between, uh, as crazy as it might sound, the experienced veteran in the weight class, Molly McCann, making her sixth appearance at the weight class uh, against the relative newcomer, Lara Procopio. Uh, and I got to go with experience over youth in this fight. I believe that Molly McCann has the experience going into this fight uh, and her output going into this fight as well. Even though we saw Laura Procopio take on Carol Rosa in her UFC debut, uh, which just barely outstruck in that fight and actually landed 169 total strikes. Um, I'm, I'm a little critical with fighters, especially that get the, uh, even though you lose your UFC debut, you get the first round, the first fight jitters out of your way. You do not want to start your uh, UFC career 0-2. In fact, a lot of fighters on this card are put in that type of situation. Um, but I have to go with Molly McCann be an amnesty decision going into this fight. And we move on to the women's bantamweight division. This is a very interesting fight between Carol Rosa and Jocelyn Edwards. In my opinion, this could be a sleeper for uh, fight of the night if Molly McCann and Lara Procopio doesn't steal the show uh, early on in the card. But Kayla Rosa, I'm going, going with in this fight against the Pan Panamanese fighter, uh, Jocelyn Edwards. Kayla Rosa, in her two UFC fights, has landed a total of 291 total strikes. Um, in one round against Vanessa Mello in her last fight, she outstruck her 47-4. to four. Those are incredible, incredible numbers. She lands a whopping 9.7 sneaky strikes per minute. I believe that this will be a stand-up fight, and I believe it will go in favor of Kale Rosa. So I got Kale Rosa the unanimous decision. Move on to a 160-pound catchweight fight between Devontae Smith and Justin James. James, by the way, taking this fight on short notice, to, uh, replacing Alex De Silva. Justin James, short and stocky, surrendering an 8-inch reach advantage to Devontae Smith. Devontae Smith, by the way, there hasn't been rankings uh, for this fight, for this fight in particular, that it has been released quite yet because this is still a developing story here uh, with this fight. I'm going with Devontae Smith. If this fight does in fact go through, right now it's kind of up in the air. I haven't been able to get too much information on this fight, and a lot of fights on this card have been crumbling due to COVID. 
Um, but I'm going with Devontae Smith. I believe the lead's going to be too long and right and uh, lanky for uh, Justin James. Justin James is extremely short and stocky for 155 pounds. This is even a catchweight fight. So I, I can't foresee Justin James, even though he's a strong starter, I don't think he'd be able to get on the inside to get a first round knockout, which I think is, is going to be his best bet going into this fight. I don't foresee him taking this fight down to the ground, even though he's got five submission victories. Uh, I believe that this will be the first time, actually, Devontae Smith will go the distance. Justin James is a typical guy to take out with strikes, um, unless you land a very flush knee to the body. Um, so perhaps a little unorthodox. This would it be the first time Devontae Smith will go the distance with a victory um, if it does go the way that I think it will, which will be a decision maker for Justin or for pardon me for Devontae Smith. Yet another 145 pound prospect matchup here between the Dagestanian Timur Belayev against Martin Day. Martin Day looking to make his First UFC victory in his UFC career. 0-3 so far in the promotion, taking on a very tough, very, very talented Timur Belayev. Uh, Timur Belayev, one of the bigger betting favorites on this card, a minus 333, only behind Corey Sandhagen. Against, it's crazy to think, and you can follow along the uh, the odds in the description down below. It's crazy to think that Frankie Edgar is the biggest underdog on this card. I'm just saying. Um, but I got Timur Belayev uh, in this fight. Like what Boss Rudin said, every single strike is different. He can throw anything. He's got a very good question mark kick. He's very aggressive. He got cracked in his UFC debut. I don't see that happening again. So I'm going to go with Timur Belayev in this fight. It's one of my more confident picks going into this fight card. Go on to the 205-pound weight class between Mike Rodriguez against Danilo Marquez. Marquez, one of the bigger betting underdogs on this card, plus 200 underdog, which I kind of found surprising. He had a pretty impressive UFC debut, at least in my opinion, uh, against Hadis and Burakimov back at UFC 243, where he attempted a whopping 16 takedowns. He landed four, but that was a relentless takedown attack, uh, attack that he had, which I actually think will play in his favor against Mike Rodriguez. Now he's got to watch out for his gas tank. His gas tank held up. But that's an extremely difficult type of game plan to implement in mixed martial arts. Uh, anybody that's ever grappled against the cage can agree with me. I do think that he'll come out with a similar style against Mike Rodriguez. Mike Rodriguez, by the way, coming over, coming off a submission loss against Ed Herman, rather controversially. I'll talk about that more tomorrow when I talked about it in my preview yesterday. Uh, it, which really should have been a TKL victory, but the referee called it and needed the groin. They move on to the next round. He got caught Nicky Moore against Ed Herman. Uh, what we did see in that fight, he's he's got a very high level output as Mike Rodriguez. By the way, he also has a five and a half inch reach advantage despite surrendering two inches in height. I believe that Danilo Marquez, however, will get on the inside, grind this fight out of the cage, and get a big upset victory via unanimous decision. Now, a fight that nobody is really talking about. Michael Johnson against Clay Guida. A whopping nearly 60 fights between these two fellows. And it's kind of it's kind of crazy that, uh, hey, is T-Bone back or is this just a rare treat? No, I am back. I am back. Um, uh, quite surprising that these people, that these two have not run into each other as of yet. And... How I see this fight going, I believe that'll be a Michael Johnson victory via TKO. It'll be the first time that Clay Guida's been finished via strikes in some time. But I believe Michael Johnson's boxing is superior. Will Clay Guida take this fight down to the ground? He, he's talked, he talked about it today in the virtual on the media tour. Um, and he also has this, I believe it's the sixth most takedowns in UFC history. Uh, with 67 takedowns, with an hour 46 of total control time, which is the third most of the UFC's 155-pound weight class. Uh, and I do see, uh, I mean, Michael Johnson's been submitted nine times in his mixed martial arts career, and Clay Guida has 13 submission victories in his mixed martial arts career. However, we haven't seen it in over a decade. I would love to see him dust that off, and I was going to pick Clay Guida via submission, However, my recent history, I, I, for some reason, I always go with these experienced veterans that have a lot of submission victories that completely abandon them. I always pick them by submission for whatever reason. Diego Sanchez, I've always picked by submission. It never happens. 
Carlos Condit, always pick submission, never happens. Even Alistair Overy, try to pick submission, never happens. Even PJ Penn sometimes, I go with, with him via submission, hasn't happened. Um, so I have to defer to that logic here. I don't think Clay Guida is going to take this fight down to the mat and try to get a submission. I might be eating my words. Uh, if there's one way that Clay Guida might win this fight, it might be by submission, in my opinion. However, I do see Michael Johnson winning this fight. Could it be a decision? Could it be by decision? More than likely. Uh, but I'm going with a uh, rather unorthodox pick, pick here. I think Michael Johnson with his elite level boxing could finish Clay Guida. Now, my personal favorite fight on this card in the 155 pound division to, to kick off the main card, Diego Fajera takes on Benil Darush, an extremely important fight for the top 10 of the 155 pound weight class and an excellent opportunity for both of these fighters. A must, must win fight for the two of them. And at a perfect time, too, with everybody talking about the 155 pound weight class, if they get an impressive victory here, impressive enough, they could be put up there with names such as Dan Hooker, Tony Ferguson, Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Charles Oliveira. I really believe that these two guys have the potential to be up there with those fellas. However, I don't think there's enough eyes on this event to warrant that. But I definitely think their talent is warranted enough. And Benio Larish was supposed to face off against Charles Oliveira early on this year. Uh, they, this is actually a rematch from about 2014, where it was Diego Pena taking the fight on short notice in Brazil. Uh, and it was Benio Larish that was able to control the fight pretty much all three rounds, leading to a 30-27 decision victory. I believe that it'll go very similarly. Uh, Diego Fajera, a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, very dangerous on the ground. Even though Benil Darush is able to control him in a lot of different positions on top, he does have to be careful within the transitions. That's what Benil Darush was saying all week and rewatching their fight. I can definitely tell when there's any bit of space, Diego Fajera is extremely dangerous. I believe that Benil Darush will take a stand up approach to this fight as opposed to his fight back in 2014 where he took the fight down to the mat, but Benil Darush is that experience all over the place, by the way. He's also, I believe it was 2010, yeah, he won the Noki World Championships as a brown belt. Now there's a much, much, there's a big difference between a brown belt and a third degree black belt in jiu-jitsu. I don't think Benil Darush at any point will it cross his mind will he try to take this fight down to the mat and try to get a submission. I don't foresee that happening. Uh, unless he rocks Diego Fajera. I mean, every black belt turns to a white belt when they're getting elbows dropped on their head. I don't foresee that happening, however. I believe that Diego Fajera is a little too experienced for that in mixed martial arts for that to warrant, but it, it certainly could happen. But I see Benil LaRouche keeping this fight standing, perhaps clipping Diego Fajera and getting a TKO victory in the second round. Welcome back to you, and I appreciate it, Todd Kennedy. G Rob. Glad you're streaming again. Happy um, you're back from deployment. I appreciate it, brother. Okay, so this is a rather strange turn of events here. Number 13 rate Cody Stammen is now taking on the Palestinian Escar. Escar at 135 pounds. Cody Stammen, much respect to him. Uh, this was he was supposed to fight Rob Navalashali, which is a very important fight at the 135 pound weight class, which would have really put the both of them. Uh, in the talks for the top 10 of, of the 135 pound division. And he could have just as easily said, okay, I'm gonna wait for Jamal Tavala-Shali, who by the way had to pull out of the fight due to COVID-19 complications. He could have waited for him for that to succeed and eventually get this fight rebooked. But he's like, nah fam, I'm gonna take on Andre Ewell. Andre Ewell, however, tested positive for COVID-19. This follow was followed up by two negative tests but due to the mandatory quarantine protocols the UFC has implemented, which I have the utmost respect for, he was taken off the car. So in steps, the Palestinian Eskar, Eskar making his UFC debut, coming off the unanimous decision victory uh, in the main event of LFA 92 against Kevin Worth. I got this fight going to Cody Stammen, the unanimous decision. I think he's going to be able to control the fight against the UFC newcomer. I uh, don't foresee Eskar Eskar getting a first round finish, even though he throws some wild haymaker hooks, which connected in his fight against Kevin Worth, mind you. 
but I don't foresee him connecting against Cody Stammon. Cody Stammon, I believe, is one of the dark horses at 135. He still has to be robbed of all, shall I? I'm really extremely disappointed that fight fell through. But much respect to Cody Stammon, staying on this card, willing to take on anybody. With really, I got Cody, yeah. And Cody Stammon, one of the bigger betting favorites. In fact, I believe the second uh, highest, third, actually, I take that back to more of Belayev. Uh, Corey Sanhagen, Timur Goliath, and then Cody Sanhagen, the three biggest betting favorites on this card. Cody Stammen, a minus 325 favorite against the plus 288 underdog is Scar. Is Scar. Uh, I don't see a Scar getting a victory in this fight, honestly. I think Cody Stammen going to be able to control the fight and get a decision victory. Uh, or perhaps he might get a finish. I, I highly doubt. A Scar might connect with one of those wild hooks because he throws hooks from such a wide angle. Uh, but I don't see that happening. Another extremely exciting fight. I'm telling you, this is a fantastic card. In fact, this card in particular might be more stacked in the pay-per-view next week. I really mean that. Now, don't get me wrong. Kamaru Usman against Gilbert Burns is a fantastic fight. I cannot wait. But if you look at the rest of the main card, I'm not calling it a weak card. This is more of a compliment to this card. We got the UFC debut of Manel Cape coming over from Ryzen. Uh, against number five ranked Alexandre Pantoja. Now, out of principle, this is just out of principle for myself. I always go with the experienced UFC veteran over the UFC newcomer. How is that working out for me? You ask. Well, this has been a, a thing for a thing of mine for years. Justin Gaethje came over to the UFC against Michael Johnson. I was picking Michael Johnson. Justin Gaethje beat uh, Michael Johnson. Most recently, Michael Chandler against Dan Hooker. I went with Dan Hooker. Out of that. Um, stubbornness of mine. Michael Chandler proved me wrong. However, I'm extremely confident in this one, however. Oh, speaking of that, Ben Askren. Ben Askren also recently as well. I was picking Robbie Lawler over Ben Askren. That didn't work out well for me. So I'm over 3 on the last three. Uh, but I believe that the experienced UFC veteran, I believe that this is a much different scenario, fighting from Rise, transitioning over from Ryzen over to the UFC. And to justify that a little bit, I became a fan of the sport right as Pride was integrating into the UFC, and you didn't really see the Pride fighters do so hot initially in the UFC. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of years later when you saw fighters like Shogun or even Alistair Overeem here eventually uh, taking the lead within the UFC. But it took some time. The same thing with Minel Cape. Uh, I believe the same thing will happen. The rule set is extremely different, and I think the biggest thing is fighting from a ring into a, into a cage. Now, Habib is a major exception to this. He had an excellent transition, but I think that this is an extreme change. If you watch Manel Cape fight in Ryzen, he was wearing shoes, like boxing shoes. Good to see you back on YouTube. I appreciate it. Well, look who came to APAL. Hey, now, come on. Uh, I'm going to – hold on. Give me a second here. Um, Manel Cape – was wearing boxing shoes. Now, if you ask Ken Shamrock what boxing shoes do to somebody, Ken Shamrock at UFC 1, this was years later, however, in an interview, he said the UFC fixed it against Hoist Gracie because they said he couldn't wear his wrestling shoes. Henceforth, took away his balance. If they took away my balance, Hoist Gracie wouldn't have submitted me. Now, I don't think Manel Cape will be able to wear shoes in the UFC the way he was in Ryzen, because Ryzen, you know, it's basically today's pride. Um, I don't think he'll be able to wear those shoes in the UFC. So that might take away his balance. I believe that Alexandre Pantoja will have a significant advantage on the ground. I believe he'll be able to grind him out up against the cage, which is new territory for Manel Cape. I'm sure he's trained with a cage before, but it's much, much different actually fighting in a cage. I think Alexander Pantoja is going to grab up against the cage, get a, get a submission victory in this fight uh, in the first round. Well, look who gained eight pounds. What's funny is, actually, uh, during this deployment, I, by the way, I weigh around 190 most of the time. I weigh about 190. I started lifting a lot more when I was over there, but also stopped watching my diet because, let's be fair, I was extremely bored over there. And I'd rather be bored with mozzarella sticks. That defect is good over there, by the way. Um, really glad to see you're back. I appreciate it. Um, so I got a little careless, and I weighed up to 210. I gained 20 pounds. Now, I wish I could say it was all muscle. I mean, I mean, look at me. Like, I'm, I'm jacked. 
No, it was it was not a healthy weight. So I started counting calories for the first time in my life, and it sucked. It sucked. I started doing a lot more cardio, and I got down to 195. Um, now I think it's a healthy 195, but I'm definitely not fat by any means. So I guess that you can say I gained five pounds. Anyway, quite the shocker in my opinion, the co-main event, number four ranked Frankie Edgar taking out number two ranked Corey Sandhagen, the biggest underdog on the card. This is absolutely shocking me. The plus 300 underdog Frankie, the answer Edgar against the minus 400 favorite Corey Sandhagen. I completely understand why Corey Sandhagen is the favorite in this fight, considering Frankie Edgar's last fight against Pedro Munoz. I had that fight going in favor of Munoz, and so did um, a lot of uh, so did a lot of the mixed martial arts community. Not everybody it was a very close fight. However, that's more of a uh, compliment to Pedro Munoz rather than a dig on Frankie Edgar. Pedro Munoz is that freaking good. I do believe that that Frankie Edgar. Uh, will be able to outstrike Corey Sandhagen on the feet despite surrendering a two-inch reach advantage. And still somehow, even though he's the former 155-pound champion, dropping back down is five inches shorter than Corey Sandhagen. Um, but I got, I'm going to go with Frankie Edgar in this fight. The plus 300 underdog, you have to take uh, Frankie Edgar there, in, in my opinion. Um, now, take the odds completely out of it. I'm still going with Frankie Edgar. I believe that he's more experienced on the feet. By the way, there's some significant, uh, he has the most fight time in UFC history. So, in my opinion, that makes you the most experienced fighter in the UFC. Uh, I'm just going to go out and say that. But some significant numbers going into this. He needs seven significant strikes, pardon me, eight significant strikes to pass Cowboy Cerrone for the number three most all time, and needs nine significant strikes to pass Yuan Yan Jacek for the number two all time most significant strikes in UFC history, and needs Jesus to pass Max Holloway. Max Holloway standing alone on the top of the mountain there. I believe that he will be able to beat, beat that for sure in this fight card. The, I believe that he'll be able to outstrike Corey Sandhagen tremendously in this fight. Uh, that's not a knock on Corey Sandhagen. Corey Sandhagen, by the way, I don't need a knock on him at all. He's extremely dangerous on the feet. We've seen that. But I really believe that it's Frankie Edgar um, that is more experienced and has the advantage anywhere the fight goes. So I'm quite shocked he's the plus 300 underdog going into this fight. i got to go with Frankie, the answer, Edgar. And this, this really has to be a title eliminator about, I mean, I, I don't really understand it. Then there's no argument there. This is a title eliminator bout. And if Frankie Edgar does get a victory here, he's going to be fighting for a world title in three different weight classes. That is quite shocking. Unless he runs into Josie Aldo. Now, Josie Aldo, I freaking hate him at 135 pounds. I, I love Josie Aldo. I, I might have came him off wrong. I hate the fact that he's cutting that much weight. It's ugly. It's disgusting. I don't like it. I love Josie Aldo. However, if Frankie Edgar fights Josie Aldo at 135, it, it's kind of like Sam I am. I think Josie Aldo beats him at 135. He beats him here. He beats him there. He beats him anywhere, in my opinion. Um, where Frankie Edgar could very well be the 135-pound champion. Even though he got – look, I, I do believe it was a good – a rather lucky decision go thrown his way against Pedro Munoz. Um he could very well defeat the winner of Algerman Sterling and poor Peter Young. I really do believe that. Against the caliber of Edgar, I can't pick him exactly right. Sam Hagen's take down defense is 30%, which is as much as you use his work ethic. <laughs> That's great. That's really funny. You are exactly correct. Uh, I mentioned that yesterday. Uh, he's got a 30% takedown defense. However, I, I don't believe that Frankie Edgar will try to take this fight down to the ground. I really believe that it'll be a stand-up battle that will go in favor of Frankie Edgar. I mean, think about it. Frankie Edgar outboxed a prime BJ Penn, who was one of the greatest boxers in mixed martial arts history in his prime. So I am very, very shocked. I'm very shocked. I'm blown away that he's the biggest underdog on this card. I'm not mad about it. If you want to throw a couple of dollars on this card for an underdog, Frankie Edgar, I'm assuming a lot, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people are noticing that, and those betting odds are going to change by come tomorrow. Another quite surprising underdog on this card in the main event of the evening, Alistair Overeem takes on Alexander Volkov. I always want to see Alistair Overeem get the submission victory. It won't happen. I guarantee you it won't happen. And I can nearly promise you that this fight won't reach the five-round mark. If it does, 
I believe that'll be going in favor of Alexander Volkov. Both elite level strikers, both big strikers. Uh, I can't think of the last time Alistair Overeem has fought a guy, maybe Travis Brown, that has a similar reach to him. Uh, and it's Alexander Volkov, three inches taller than the Reem Alistair Overeem. I got this fight to Alistair Overeem. Here is why. He's got a very diverse game now. He's training out of Elevation Fight Team in Colorado. He might try to take this fight down to the ground and try to expose some holes in Alexander Volkov's game there. You saw Curtis Blades do it. Now I get it. Alistair Overeem is not Curtis Blades. However, uh, he did very good in his last fight against... I'm blanking on the name right now. I apologize. I should have had it up. Let me stall here for a second while it loads. In his last fight against Augusto Sakai. And he was able to brutalize him with elbows on the ground. I believe that he will have a very similar result. You can even say the same thing with Walt Harris as well. Uh, I believe he will have a very similar result uh, against Alexander Volkov. He'll somehow find a way to get this fight on the ground and be able to get the finish uh, with ground and pound. That's how I see that fight going. It might be one of the more unorthodox picks, uh, but so are most of my picks. And I'm extremely confident in these ones. And yeah, yeah there it is. In the link in the description down below, you can play tapology.com with your fellow T-Bone MMA fans and myself to find out who has the most accurate picks. You can compete with myself for UFC Fight Night, Alistair Overeem against Alexander Volkov, and tomorrow morning, one championship, Unbreakable Free. Now, also tomorrow night, we got Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships, Paige Van Zandt's uh, debut, as well as Chris Levin's final combat sports fight. It's going to be a very interesting and a very long um, and a very good uh, return for T-Bone MMA. I'll be covering the fights tomorrow morning at 7.30 for one championship. And tomorrow night, I'll be covering Bare Knuckle Fighting, Knuckle Mania 2021. It's going to be a very exciting weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, what do y'all think? It, it's going to be a freaking good... Uh, I'm sorry I've been ignoring y'all. Uh, what does everybody think? Sorry I'm late, T-Bone. Um... I have to watch this one back. Hey, I'm, thanks for showing up, Steve. Uh, sit back, relax, kick your feet up. T-Bone is on. Let's, let's, light up some, let, let's light some weed up. I love it, T uh, TW. Um, those elbows against the Kyra Oof. Those, that was a rough, rough finish. And I, I very well could see that fight, this fight ending very similarly. Uh, the link doesn't exist for some reason. Uh, let me try that. I'm going to try that again. Thank, thank you for letting me know. I'll try to uh, figure that out. T-Bone, shout out your fans. What's up, Drew? Uh, Sakai said Overeem broke his ribs with his knees. He couldn't defend and take down very well. Tune in for bare knuckle fighting. Do you remember Do you remember Moose? Who's Moose? Oh, you. Um, I don't. I'm sorry. I remember most of y'all. I might not remember you. I'm sorry about that. T-Bone, thank you for service. I'm a Coast Guard veteran. Love watching you. You are the homie. I appreciate it, Drew. Yeah, the link for Tapology seems broken. I'll fix that. I'll fix that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll fix that. Come tomorrow. If you guys want to tune in one championship, I understand it's early for y'all in the States, but if y'all are working at that time, I'm happy to kick off the morning uh, for you guys. Give us a flex. No, Brant, you perv. Um, but I'll, I'll fix that. But anyway, guys, I just want to appreciate, I appreciate you guys very much for tuning in and tune in tomorrow.